put it on your video. Did anyone manage to get a twinkle in your eye? Well, there's plenty of time. But we'll be using it tonight if you have it. Okay. So if you recall, last week we did something on the three weeks. So it's been two weeks since we last learned the twinkle in your eye. Subtitled Kabbalistic Remedies for Preserving Youth and Memory. So we'll review a page and then there's a lot of exciting things to learn here. So we're going to review starting on page 24. We'll review like half a page and then it'll be fresh material. Okay, so and we're at 24, the middle of the page. Welcome, welcome everyone putting on right now, coming on, joining us, Baruch Hashem. Okay, so here goes. The Medrash teaches us that the Avos observed the mitzvahs before the Torah was given. Avraham kept the entire Torah to the minutest detail and Yaakov even sacrificed the Pesach lamb. Yet, because their service was of a voluntary nature, the mitzvahs that the Avos observed were ethereal in quote aromas. Hasidic thought explains that their intuitive mitzvah observance did not create the, the desired bond between heaven and earth, a union that can only be accomplished by those commanded to observe the mitzvahs. People like us, Jews like us, the sanctity of the patriarch's mitzvah observance thus dispersed like a pleasant aroma. Top of page 25. By contrast, from the moment Hashem revealed himself to the Jewish people at Har Sinai and gave us the Torah, every mitzvah that we observe unites the spiritual aspect of reality with its physical aspect. As every mitzvah that we perform suffices, suffuses the reality with holiness, with sanctity, with kedusha. So what did this just say? That every mitzvah, we do, since we're here post Sinai, every mitzvah we do unites ruchnias and gashmias and fills reality with kedusha. And we spoke about how like you know, everything a woman does for the house is considered um, everything, moving the spoon from the table to the sink, so fills the world with Kedusha. Everything, we just have pressing the dryer button. Everything we do, it's so exciting. We just have to have it in mind so we can enjoy filling the world with Kedusha, with each mitzvah. Indeed, the Hebrew word mitzvah, mem tzadik vav he, means together, tzatza. By having proper kavana, kavanas in mind, so kavana, we have to have, so we're so lucky that we're learning the proper kavanas to have in mind, simple kavanas for people like us. We un unify the spiritual source of every mitzvah with its practical application. Thus, we become a direct conduit for more kedusha, more sanctity to enter the world. When I was preparing this last night, like it, that we're a conduit for Kedusha in the world. Everything, everything that we do, every mitzvah that we do, and everything, you know, on, we're on the way to the mitzvah, everything. You know, if you're walking to do Bikr Cholim, the walking is a mitzvah. So it's all filling the world with holiness. But this is a two-way channel. And while we direct more holiness into the world with every mitzvah that we do, our consciousness rises via that channel to a higher place. And the higher our consciousness rises, the more fulfilling our aging experience will be. And of course, we will all want to have a fulfilling aging experience. That's why we're here learning this together. So our consciousness rises to a higher plane. To have this in mind, to be open to it. Let's be open to our consciousness rising to a higher plane. See, there's a few nice people that have their, their cameras on. If you, you get extra credit if you put your camera on and you give me energy. 
So just more brilliant, thank you, thank you. So that more brilliant thoughts could enter my mind from Hashem. <laughs> yes, do your part. Let me see your smiling face. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Baruch Hashem, I'm such a lucky girl. Okay, so, and then it's speaking about the connect, the next, the next paragraph is speaking a connect, connection of the word mitzvah, mem tzadik vav hey, with Hashem's name Havaya, yud ke vav ke. So the, I'm just gonna say this part from outside. So the last two letters of both words are vav hey, both mitzvah and havaya end with vav hey. And the first two letters in atbash, everyone remembers atbash, where you can substitute the first letter for the last letter, the aleph for the tuf, and then the base with the shin and the gimel with the resh, it's called atbash. So by atbash, mem tzadik becomes yud hey. So this is, so this idea is in some mysterious way, the word mitzvah is a reflection of all four letters of Hashem's essential name, Havaya. And with every mitzvah we perform, we thus manifest the spirituality of Hashem's essential name into this mundane world. So it's like a big deal. We're bringing Hashem's name into this world with every mitzvah we do. I hope everyone is inspired and we, and this is a mitzvah, we're learning Torah together. This is so exciting. We're doing it right now. <laughs> and we're just, you can just sit in your own house. You can make a l'chaim, l'chaim, l'chaim. It's so convenient. Okay. The secret of old age relates in particular to Avraham, who was the first man in history to become recognizably old as noted in the introduction. We're now, anyone who came in late on the, in our wonderful book, Twinkle, The Twinkle in Your Eye by Rav Yitzhak Ginsberg. And we're on the top of page 26. And by the way, um, you know, this past Thursday night, it was announced that there would be a Fabringen and Kfar Chabad of students of Rav Yitzhak. And it was, they never said that he was really gonna come. But Baruch Hashem, he came and for Brang for over two hours and there were Nagunam and just brilliant teaching, fascinating. But the Rav taught a, a little bit about Yeheskel's chapters 40 mm. through 44, which the Rav said it's good to learn during the three weeks. It's about the rebuilding of the third, the, re, the building of the third base of Migdash. And it, and it just was fascinating stuff that just enlivened it. It was, it was wonderful. And he taught um, the Mishnah, Mishnah Shabbos, the first parak, it, it was everything. It was just filled with light and Baruch Hashem, it was wonderful to see him. So see our get well photos have paid off. Baruch Hashem, he's feeling better. He should go from strength to strength and from not, not have nachas with us, how we're learning. We're learning from his, the second one now of his books all together. Okay, so the top of page 26. But according to the Zohar, Avraham not only became old, he taught others the secret of old age also. He did this by means of his mysterious, in quotes, beard parlor, as we shall explain. This is particularly fascinating when we remember, as we saw above, that the world old Zaken, Zion Kufnun, with a different vowelization means beard, Zakan. Okay. So, one of the Torah, so this is all new material, by the way. We didn't do this um, since back on the top of the last page, in case it seemed fresh. One of the Torah's verses related to Avraham states, and Avraham planted a tamarisk tree, an A-shell, it's called. In Beersheba, he proclaimed there the name of Havaya, God World. The unique, so God World, Kael Olam, this unique phrase meaning God World, the name Aleph Lamed, which we pronounce Kael if we're not davening, Olam. Rather than what we would expect, Kael Ha Olam, God of the World implies that not only is Hashem eternal, world in Hebrew also means eternity, but that Hashem is one with the world. He is omnipresent. So Hashem is one with the world. That's so important for people to know. So it's our, our, our father, Avraham, who proclaimed this to the world. God is one with the world. He's omnipresent. 
And I always feel much better when I remember that we're sitting here in Hashem's presence. So Hashem is omnipresent. Long before Einstein came on the scene, Avraham was aware of the secret of four dimensional space time and that divinity permeates all of reality. It was this seed of knowledge that he planted in the consciousness of mankind by disseminating a monothe monotheistic faith in Hashem, the creator and the unifier of space and time. So what is this saying? So, so Avraham, our father, taught monotheism and somebody who doesn't, you know, somebody can think monotheism, mono is one, can think that there's one God. Like we don't, we don't worship a lot of small gods that you could put on your shelf, worship when necessary, but there's only God. Monotheism means there's nothing else but God. And this is like, I think it's one of the ideas that takes a lifetime to really deeply grasp. What does it really mean? You know, there's only God, it's all God. So we'll, We'll learn more about this. I always like this subject. Okay. Hashem unifies space and time. The Zohar interprets the three letters of the Hebrew word, tam the tree, a shell, tamarisk, it's called in English. Let's call it a shell, Aleph Shin Lamed, as an acronym for the colors red, which is Adam with an Aleph, black, Shachar with a Shin, and white, Lavan with a Lamed, a shell. Each color represents a particular state of consciousness of Hashem, which the Arizal describes as the progression of beard colors from youth to old age. Okay, so, and by the, we're mentioning the Arizal, the Arizal, I do want to mention that Hey Av is, um, it's one of the highlights of the three weeks, certainly the highlight of the nine days, the middle day of the nine days is the Arizal's year at sight. So it's a good time to go to Tzvat and touch this cave or dove and become one. Okay, so the, let's, we're going to talk about the progression of beard colors from youth to old age. Now, generally, women are not that interested <laughs> in growing a beard. It's kind of one of Hashem's jokes that one might have to deal, a woman might have to deal with a few beard ears. <laughs> I'm laughing and crying at the same time. You can join. <laughs> Join me, but okay, but but we like that that look of that man with a beard is, is a very attractive look. Okay, so we all know what beards look like. We've seen them. Okay, like King David's beard, which had seven different shades of red in his youth and early adulthood. One's beard is initially red. In its rectified state, the initial red beard consciousness manifests as a full-blooded run towards God, one realizes that God is all, or in Yiddish, God is alls. Running towards God is rutso, running to God, because we realize God is, is everything, i.e. that he is the only true reality. So this again, is, it's a lifetime. We believe it, yes, God is the only true reality, but to live it, to feel it, to not forget it, is, is the work of a lifetime, if you So this is God is all, this is the initial, this is the youth. God is all, experiencing himself confined by the boundaries of physical reality, the red bearded youth aspires to return to the origin of creation, to become one with the creator himself, become one with God, which reminds me of a little joke. You might have heard it before. You'll forgive me. It's short. So if you've heard it before. So, <laughs> so the Zen master goes into the Crown Heights pizza parlor and checks all the toppings. And the pizza man asks him, what does he want? And he says, make me one with everything. That's the whole joke. Don't laugh. Don't cry. No. OK, make me one with everything. <laughs> I think that's funny. No, but no one else has to. It's all right. No pressure. Okay. So we want to become one with the creator himself. Yes, why not? One with God. Doesn't it sound like a consciousness expanding experience? Okay. Next stage. That's stage one. Stage one is pretty, you know, pretty good stage. Here's stage two. 
During the black bearded years of our lives, we invest our energies in nurturing a harmonious and loving marital relationship. From our base, our home, we reach out to help our community and the world around. At this stage of life, we love the creator by loving what he loves, and he loves us and all that he created for his glory until we reach the realization that all is God or in Yiddish, alts is God. So all is God. So, you know, also God is all is like Shema Yisro, like God is everything. And then everything is God. I mean, we see reality and it's all God. Isn't that amazing? We reach the realization that all is God. All of this stuff, it's just incredible. The computer, <laughs> everything, you, me, our thoughts. Instead of running upwards, we feel ourselves descending downwards. That's the shuv, the return, the show from the pristine spiritual reality of our soul's essence to fulfill our mission on earth by selflessly devoting ourselves to the other, our shlicha. So, so the second stage of the three stages is coming back down to do our shlicha. First, we're running to be one with God. Then we're coming back down to do, our, when you have general shlichas, every Jew has a certain shlichas. And then we have our individual shlichas in our corner of the world, because nobody else can light up our corner of the world like us. Okay, now the third stage, get ready. Finally, the white beard that we aspire to in old age represents the united consciousness that, has, that Abraham instilled in his followers, Havaya, God, world, that God is all, God is all and simultaneously all is God, both directions, through his perception of the almighty as God world who unites space, time, and consciousness, Abraham taught us how to be in an ongoing state of Ratzo Vishov, run upward and return downward at one and the same time. So let's go over what this is an important paragraph. Okay, first of all, space, time, and consciousness is known like in Kabbalah and Hasidic space is Olam, time is Shana, and consciousness is Nefesh. So every moment where we're in a space, look, please check around, see you're in a space. It's a particular moment, 8.49 p.m. in Israel, and there's a consciousness, each of us are, are here. <laughs> so Hashem unites space, time, and consciousness. And this ongoing rutz of a show, because in each moment it's something different. Sometimes we can do the rutz moment of running towards God and other times, back to our shlichas. And sometimes we can be doing both at once to not lose consciousness of being wanting to be one with God as we do our shlichas. So those are the three colors of beard and the three states of consciousness that they represent. And the red beard is a relatively feminine state. The black beard is more masculine, but the white beard of old age is the union of the two. In our old age, Feminine consciousness as manifest in youth is re-energized to equate and unite with our masculine consciousness. We are able to simultaneously see both sides of the coin, which in general, I mean, seeing both sides of the coin is, is something that we've been speaking about, bearing the paradox, like there's so many paradoxes that we've spoken a lot about the paradox of having weeping on one side of the heart and chev and joy on the other side of the heart as, as Jewish life, because we have to see reality accurately in order to truly empathize with people who are suffering. And we have to believe at at the next moment could be the Geula Shalema. So that's one paradox. So let's see how I have, so, <clears throat> so this was the message that Avraham transmitted about old age. Indeed, he minted a coin on which there was an old man and an old woman on one side and a young man and a young woman on the other. Avraham's coin system united the consciousness of male and female youth and old age, united the consciousness of all of these 
And I think, uh, and this is a quote from Baba Kama 97D about Avraham's coin system. So, so watch out when coins come your way, <laughs> when you're checking the, the, the uh, Tzedakah box, you know, that you might find one of those coins from Avraham Avinu with a young woman and a young man on one side and an old woman and an old man on the other side to unite it all. And, and one of the things I noticed when I became from 47 years ago was um, suddenly I had friends of all ages. That was one of the perks of, of from life, of Hasidic life. Like till then, most of my friends were my age, but suddenly I had friends that were 25 years older, 10 years younger. And now, you know, certainly it's very consciousness expanding to have friends of all different age groups. So Avraham united all of these consciousnesses, even in the coins, that he minted. Okay, so this is very exciting. We are, we've just finished chapter one of The Twinkle in Your Eye, and we're about to start chapter two. So if you have, you're lucky enough to have the book, try to remember to, you can, if you're in Israel, you can call Achia Witt to get the book, and otherwise it can be gotten, I guess, on Amazon through, or through Gale Nai. The secret of a late chapter two, the secret of a lengthy lifespan. Everyone wants to know about this secret. There are, not, there are two mitzvahs in the Torah that explicitly promise a lengthy lifespan span to those who observe them. These are the mitzvah of honoring one's parents and the mitzvah of sending away the mother bird before taking eggs or chicks from her nest. So first we're gonna look at the quotes from Chumash, and then we're gonna learn a lot of levels of what these mitzvahs might be. First of all, honor your father and mother so that your days may be lengthened. That's from Shemos, from the first time the 10 commandments are listed. And then from in Devorim, the second time when they're listed in the Eschana, and it says, honor your father and mother in the way that Havaya, your God, commanded you in order that you live long. Then also in Devorim is, you must surely send away the mother and then take the off, offspring to yourself so that you will ben benefit and you will live long. So we're about to find out what all of this could mean right now to us. Some biblical commentators explain explain that lengthened days in these verses refer to the world to come, a world that exists in the sphere of Bina. This relates to the mother principle. It is a feminine world. Once again, we see how a long lifespan relates to the rise of feminine consciousness in our psyche. And, and this is a basic idea in, in Kabbalah and Chassid is the rising of Malchus as time goes along, getting closer to the Geula that Malchus, Binyan HaMalchus, the building of Malchus. Okay, the top of 30, respecting parents. As explained in the previous chapter, the secret of retaining a good memory as we age depends on the union of the father and the mother principles. This obviously relates to the mitzvah of honoring our parents. Let's see, I have footnote four circled here. So if you have the book on um, the footnotes, or it's on page 155. Old footnote four, ultimately Hashem is our father and the collective soul of the Jewish people, the Shekhinah is our mother. So ultimately it's Hashem who's our father, the Shekhinah is our mother. It is these two who together nurture their child the soul of Mashiach. This relates to the mitzvah of sending away the mother bird before taking the chicks, as explained below, as we will learn. Okay, so back to the text, page 30. Honoring our parents is still relevant after they have passed away. This is a quote from the Rambam. So this mitzvah still applies even if we are already very old and our parents have passed away. This is very interesting now, take notes. In fact, honoring them after their demise is even more significant because escaping the confines of the physical body allows the soul to permeate reality even more effectively. 
And this is a basic idea in Tanya, in chapter 27 of Agera Sakodesh, the Alter Rebbe speaks about the, that the soul is more, the soul of Sadiqim, the soul of someone who's, pa who's passed away is more in this world after they've passed. Thus, the spirit of the righteous is even more present and active in the physical world than it was before they passed away. Then we can truly pay tribute to their honor and bond with their spiritual essence. So let's find out how do we pay tribute to their honor and bond with their spiritual essence? That's a good part to bond with. Okay. One of the most important ways to respect our parents during their lifetime and even after they have passed away is having them in mind while occupying ourselves with the essence of life, i.e. with Torah study and observance, which are referred to as our life and the length of our days. So having our parents in mind while we're learning Torah, like right now we're learning Torah, right? We have our parents in mind. This is a way to honor them. It could be like a makif, just a surrounding idea to have in mind when we're learning Torah, that it's a way that we are honoring our parents, just having that concept in mind. In the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother is immediately preceded by remember the Shabbos. Or to put it in the right order, it's in the Ten Commandments, the fourth mitzvah is remember the Shabbos. And the fifth commandment is honor your father and mother. Okay, so, and later Shabbos appears again with parental respect in the very same verse, quote, every man his mother and father shall revere and observe my Shab Shabbosim, Shabbatot. The juxtaposition of Shabbos observance and honoring one's parents teaches us that there is something in the very essence of Shabbos that relates to honoring one's parents. Now, this is a very interesting idea. It's saying that just in our keeping Shabbos, we can have in mind that this is a way of honoring our parents. Shabbos, the day of rest, allows us to relive in our, in our memory, our parents' home and the love and warmth that they bestowed upon us. I mean, in general, I, I was thinking that like in general, when we, remember, <laughs> when we remember anybody, it's nice to remember something positive about them. Like why waste time with a lot of negative memories about people? Let's remember something positive about them. I think it just sounds like such a healthy idea. Indeed, to the top of page 31, indeed the command to observe Shabbos begins with the word remember. So we've all seen that, but to actually think about it is interesting that, that, that with the, in the Ten Commandments, the remember is the first word in the command to observe Shabbos, remember. And we're speaking about memory. From this, we may conclude that Torah study and Shabbos observance are both significant ways to observe the mitzvah of honoring one's parents, which is conducive to longevity. I think this is such important information. I mean, I really didn't know this before reading it here, that we want to do something to honor our parents. How can we honor them, especially after they passed away? Learning Torah and keeping Shabbos and having it as like a mind and a makif surrounding idea that by doing this, we're honoring our parents. Isn't that cool? Yes. Okay. So, um, mm, mm, mm. Later, we will see that both of these mitzvahs are also valuable for reinforcing memory, Torah study and keeping Shabbos. Later, we will see. What better occupation can there be in our old age than studying Torah on Shabbos with the intention in mind that we are doing so to honor our parents? So. I guess it's a big deal, especially, especially when learning Torah on Shabbos to have in mind, this is honoring our parents. So let's get that, you know, it's a, and, it, and it leads to long life. So this is very handy to know, right? Right. Okay, so that's pretty easy to understand. Now we're getting to something more complicated, <laughs> sending away the mother bird. This has always been a question. I remember the first time 
47 years ago doing kitas, doing reading Chumash for the first time. It seems so, what is going on with the send? Haven't you wondered what's going on with that sending away the mother bird? And it leads to long life. Let's find out. Deriving benefit from a mother bird together with her chicks or eggs is forbidden by the Torah. It is also forbidden to take the chicks or eggs while the mother bird is sitting, the Rambam says. Many sources state that sending away the mother bird instills the attribute of compassion in our souls. Before taking the offspring, the Torah obliges us to send away the mother bird so that she will not be present to experience the pain of seeing her offspring taken away. Indeed, the attribute of compassion is a particularly valuable asset in old age. Okay, so no excuses. In Kabbalah and Hasidus, sending away the mother bird before taking the chicks or the eggs is interpreted in a number of allegorical ways. M mushels, mushling, mushalim. So let's find out what does this mean on different levels in Kabbalah and Hasidus. The word mother, aim, aleph mem, can be vocalized to read if, im, also aleph mem. Sometimes we have to make a decision to do a good deed, but then we are confronted by a barrage of ifs and buts that hinder us from doing what we should do. Evasion and procrastination are the greatest obstacles in our service of Hashem. So that's a very useful piece of information. Procrastination is the greatest obstacle in our service of Hashem. So just to notice it, you know, we please identify, huh? at least if we identify when we're falling into procrastination, I and mean, God forbid that we should give into it, but even God forbid we give into it, it's better to point out that, that I'm now having an attack of procrastination that is um, hindering my service of Hashem. Because there's so many wonderful mm -hmm. ideas we have of things to do to call that cousin in Rochester, whatever it is, and then procrastination comes and we don't make that phone call or whatever it is to recognize it, to, at least to identify it and to recognize it's the greatest obstacle in our service of Hashem. In this context, sending away the mother bird means abandoning all the ifs, because again, aim and im are both spelled the same, im is if, but abandoning all the ifs, buts, and excuses that hinder us and just doing the mitzvah. Does, that sounds like life would be much more fun. Just do the mitzvah, no more procrastination. Okay, selfless service. The shechina, the divine presence is called mother. Her chicks are the Torah and mitzvahs that we do. Since the destruction of the temple, when direct prophecy from Hashem ceased, mother has nested herself in our mundane motivations. Okay, what does this mean? So we're now going to learn about Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Bar was a disciple of the Baal Shem Tov, and we know the Baal Shem Tov in the 18th century founded the Hasidic movement. So Menachem Mendel of Bar, and Rav Yitzhak has spoke, speaks about him in, in Lev Ladas and different writings. So let's find out what did he teach? He taught that righteous individuals should conduct themselves. Now listen carefully, because this is a couple of stages here. He taught that righteous individuals could conduct themselves by contemplating the advantages and disadvantages of a given action from a mundane perspective. What will I gain and what will I lose? Mundane perspective. By doing so, they can glean the revelation of the Shekhinah concealed in reality. But while observing the mitzvah, we should ignore the external motivation roused by the apparent motivations and perform the mitzvah with a holy fire that is motivated by our inner desire to do so. So to let go of the pros and cons and just burn with a desire to do the mitzvah. 
He emphasized that the best way to influence this, this method is by learning from the mitzvah of sending away the mother bird. Okay, so how does this all fit together? We're about to find out. How does sending away the mother bird have to do with doing the mitzvah with an inner fire and not with the calculations of the, my pluses and minuses from doing the mitzvah? For example, Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Bar would only teach Torah when he was offered payment. He saw it as a sign that Hashem wanted him to speak in that place. Interesting, right? However, while he was teaching his discourse, he would send away the mother, in quotes, i.e. the thought that he would be paid for teaching and take the chicks, only teach Hashem's Torah, which was his true desire. Now, isn't that interesting? So. While, while he was still thinking about going, he thought, oh, well, they're, they're going to pay me to dot, dot, dot. And then while he was teaching, he just let go of that completely and just let the inner fire, the joy of teaching, giving over Hashem's Torah was what he had in mind while he was teaching. This advice is intended for those righteous individuals who desire to observe Torah and mitzvahs for selfless reasons, but seek heaven's consent. So he, heaven's consent, he felt, ah, oh, they're offering, I just got offered to teach in spot for the results here, so they offered to pay me, hmm. Now that sounds quite tempting, but while I'm teaching, if you happen to be in spot on Hey Up, hopefully I might be there too, come to the tent. There's a big tent on the bottom of the cemetery sponsored by a very kind anonymous Gvir, a wealthy person, and they served about a four-course dinner in this room for men to learn and women to learn, and it's free. Baruch Hashem. So that was Menachem Mendel of Bar. He went where they paid him, but while he was teaching, he transcended all sense of the pluses of being paid and just burnt with that inner fire. Okay, so I think we have time for one more paragraph. Unless there's people that have questions, should we see if someone has a question, a comment? Uh, let's look at the comments. There's nine comments in the chat. Let's take a look. Oh, there's, oh, huh. Just a few compliments. I won't take it personally. <laughs> uh, it's like removing extraneous thoughts through Torah study. Uh huh. yes, that's right. Someone said this, so getting, getting rid of extraneous thoughts, which is always, it just it does help. It does help. Um, you know, in, in davening, getting rid of extraneous thoughts, speaking of getting rid of extraneous thoughts, it's very, I find it very useful to underline the word that you're saying, you know, underline the word that you're saying. It keep, you keep track, you know where you're up to, and then you can focus on what does that word mean. It's a way to eliminate extraneous thoughts while davening. It's interesting because when children are first learning how to read, there's a tendency that they want to under, they want to point, they want to underline with their finger the word that they're saying, and they want to say the word, move their lips and say the word. And then in the, the secular, at least when I was growing up in Brooklyn, New York, the approach was when, um, so then you have to learn to read without moving your lips. But in Torah, in, in, the, in our approach, it's always better to move your lips, certainly while davening and while learning also, the moving the lips, it's not considered learning. Or you know, if you're just meditating, you need to move your lips. That's my advantage in teaching. Let's see, I'm moving my lips. Okay, I'm just gonna read a little bit more because it's almost time for our next speaker. We have a lot of people tonight. This is very cool. By our regular standards, we should feel that Hashem is encouraging us to do the good deed by directing us to fulfill the mitzvahs for our own self-interests. Perhaps what motivate, motivates us is our desire for honor, personal pleasure, or monetary compensation. Whichever it is under these circumstances while engaged in the mitzvah, we must send away the mother in quotes, i.e. the self-interests that motivate us and act with selfless enthusiasm. Let me just get this back. Okay. 
act with selfless enthusiasm. I didn't say that with enough enthusiasm. Selfless enthusiasm. It's good to be enthusiastic while doing the mitzvahs. We like that. We like when people are enthusiastic when they do those mitzvahs. We do so by being aware that even though we intended to achieve a purely selfish goal, Hashem had compassion on us and sent us this mitzvah along the way. With this thought in mind, we can selflessly take the chicks by doing the good deed. So we put away any selfish motivation that it could be a lot of fun or whatever it is to do the good deed. Then it is permissible to capture the mother by collecting our original ego, egotistic intention. They're gonna go, they'll pay you for teaching. Following the act, we should humbly accept the fact that it was the selfish reason that really caused us to observe the mitzvah. In other words, giving Hashem credit for the mitzvahs that we do. I was just in there for the selfish reasons. We then give Hashem all the credit for the fact that we fulfilled it and acknowledge that even the power to do the deed came directly from Hashem. In fact, we had no part of it at all. This is very basic idea in Rav Yitzhak Sefer Lev Ladas, to give Hashem credit for all the good that we do, because he gave us the situation, he gave us the energy, and on a more subtle level, he gave us the motivation to do it. <clears throat> 